going to get going again in our discussion of hybrid modeling, particularly five compelling patterns for hybrid modeling. Um, so we were discussing a hybrid modeling pattern involving interaction between service delivery and the population. And when you have structured workflows that depend on processes and the workflows are very defined in their structure and in the processes that go through, this is a really excellent uh, tried and true, easy to implement pattern in any logic. And it it really is is the cat's meow. It meets meets the the needs. Um, the next pattern is is rather um, different, but uh, also really really powerful. Um, and this concerns a uh, a situation where we have uh, system dynamics. The language of stocks and flows, in particular, um, in an upstream model, and uh, particularly, I want to draw your attention to situations quite common, I might add, where we where we have a general population whose dynamics we want to we want to capture because we're interested in some sub part of that general population that's of particular focus or risk. So we have a general population um, whose demographic character or some factors affecting it lead to people, some small fraction of people perhaps, um, developing concerns of you know, risk, uh, risks of certain types. Maybe it's, um, uh, ideation related to self-harm or, or related even to, to suicidal uh, thoughts. Maybe it's um, individuals reaching a point where they uh, experiment or, or try substance use. Maybe it's individuals uh, uh, being uh, developing chronic pain who are at high risk of um, uh, involvement with, with opioids. Maybe it's uh, individuals who develop diabetes and we want to track their progress at a fine grain level um, in various complications of diabetes. So the idea here is that we have a much broader population of interest, but we, we don't want to have to simulate that with all of the level of detail of the downstream population. And to give one more example, this could be a general population at risk of COVID infection, and we're concerned with people who are either themselves get infected or contacts in a, in a contact tracing sense of people with COVID, with COVID. Um, and maybe we want to trace, you know, long COVID outcomes or whatever, uh, wait blank. Um, so here, um, we want to distinguish how we want to, to represent these two sides. This upstream population, we could capture at much higher level of description, much much more roughly, maybe age and sex groups, and you know something about um, uh, level of contact. Um, this downstream population, we want to follow at an individual level. So what we're going to do is capture the general population at, at a count level. We're just going to count the number of people in different categories and so on to count the number of people in this stock or or subdivisions thereof in this stock, it's only once they reach a certain point that people become individuals. They're lent to face upon the world. So up here, they're just a number. They're a number in a stock. But once they develop a certain, gotten to a certain point, have certain risk factors or have had certain health conditions develop or have been involved in certain health processes like contact tracing, suddenly, they're a person, they're, they're an individual, and they followed after that as an individual. Occasional times we'll have them go back to a general population. Um, they'll they'll turn back into a population member. For example, maybe you have people who come down here 
get surgery in the hospital or, or are hospitalized, they become individuals. They stay as individuals for a while after that to follow them up to see if they need to represent them for care, if there's any recurrence of the issue, if there's any complications from the procedure or whatever. And then at some point, if there's not, they turn into numbers again. So this, this type of modeling divides this population up into, into an aggregate population on the one side and an individual population. Why would you do that? Well, the aggregate population has far lighter weight to simulate. Maybe 80% of the population, maybe 90% is, is just numbers of people in different bonds, right? But you have your more detailed representation for the group of focal interests, right? Um, and, and you can experiment with that. And of course, you can evolve where this individuation, this turning people into individuals come, come about. So we've pursued this strategy for quite a few models. Um, this province was guided early in the pandemic uh, by a model created by Yuan Tian, who was again here for the first day or two, um, of exactly the sort. In capacity planning, um, calculations were done, um, acute care demand, um, plans for PPE, I think may have, may have been informed by that as well, um, the personal protective equipment. And it was used for decision input was in the decision to put in place because of was the official source for, for presentations. We've also done it for diabetes sensitive renal disease and for a, a few other models as well at a research level. So it's a reliable pattern. Um, Quite easy to accomplish. I think uh, we do have a model of this sort. I will point you to it, but I'm not going to open it in the interest of time because I do want to get to 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 uh, location based models. So where would we find it if you wanted to explore it? And of course, if there's interest, you know, to bring it up as part of questions and question and answer sessions, I'm glad to do that. Okay, so where where is this? Um, I'm going to go back to the uh, participant resources, and I should have it here. There we go under hybrid models, and it's called the budding hybrid SDABM model. Bud, because that's what I referred to this process as budding off. That's from a quip by Sandro Galea at some point. Um, and a social epidemiologist of some note. People bud off um, uh, and uh, I mean, turn into particular people. We've used, uh, there was also a use of this, I know, in um, Australia in the context of, uh, of uh, emergency room and, and health service delivery um, there. Okay, so this is um, upstream aggregate. Um, and individuated subpiece of the population. Any questions about that? It has, and it's recommended by economies and elegance. Um, yeah, so this is one of the models which used it. And this is another one, um, Asian populations, and then DES. This is actually a tripartite model, this one here. It has DES for service delivery. It has agent population and it had an upstream one. And I know this doesn't look pretty, but it was pulled together in midnight sessions early in the pandemic for for decision making. Um, okay. Um, right. Um, and that's the bite. Okay. Um, like to to try another one. In this one, um, we have system dynamics influencing agent-based evolution. So here, we're going to have system dynamics used to describe continuous dynamics within agents. Think system dynamics used to describe changes in weight over time, a viral load over time, and levels of substances in the body, of tolerance levels um, for those substances in, a, in the context of uh, toxicological tolerance. Um, uh, or think about um, 
levels of immune system protection. Some of Wade's models, like the um, the model with uh, pertussis with uh, Karsten um, and Alex Doroshenko, or um, to some degree, the, the chickenpox model even had some sort of immune factor that was boosted by certain things, but it didn't have quite the continuous dynamics. No, it wasn't continuous. So yeah. that, that was the model where we really discovered what was failing. Mm. Right, right. And I'm, I'm going to mention that in a minute. OK, so let's let's go to um, open up uh, a model here. This one is rather uh, evocative to display. Um, so uh, we're going to scroll down and go to CTL state variable use any logic seven. There's a series of papers on chlamydia in one in theoretical biology and medical modeling with my first PhD student, Dave Vickers, uh, and myself, which uh, apply this to different uh, pathogens. Oops, I'm sorry, we need to go into it. No, don't, don't do the folder. Go into it, here we go, and we download, okay? Great. So we downloaded it, and we're going to go and open it in any logic. Here we go. So I'm opening it up. There we go. Okay. So first of all, I should situate you. I'm gonna close the other, close the other ones, other models, just so we could focus on this one. Uh, do I want to save that? This other one? No. Okay. So we're gonna open up person, okay? And um, I just wanna draw attention to the fact that we have uh, a person, they have um, uh, they have a set of, of characteristics. This was actually created, gosh, 15 years ago or something. So it's, it's it was created for an older version of any logic, which had things a little bit more basic that you had to do. Um, and, uh, we have a very simple state chart, which is, uh, you know, has kind of a stark view of the world um, uh, where people are living. And what's important here is that they can die if their viral load V becomes too high. Now, what is it that term determines V? Well, it's this stock flow model here. And that stock flow model is a, uh, I think even it's parameters, but I, I don't many of the parameters, I think, um, came from a published stock flow model by, I think it was by Waters in May in their book, Viral Vectors. Um, so we have uh, a representation, a simple representation, actually it's one of the simplest, of immune system dynamics together with viral vectors. So there's some viral load there's some number of uninfected cells. We have an annotation of this that was uninfected cells in the epithelium, um, uh, and then infected cells in the epithelium. Uh, that's why. And cells that are uninfected can be infected by virions, by these free virus vectors. Okay. Um, that's what's going on here. So viruses together with uninfected cells can get infected lead to infection and the cells get infected. Infected cells can die off in two ways. They can die off naturally or they can die off being killed by a cytotoxic T lymphocyte, which is a immune system, um, immune system agent that, that seeks to be called mom. Immune system actor that seeks to be called mom. Um, and uh, that so that depends on the availability of immune system strength. So there's a state variable Z or Z that um, is, is built up by immune system activation and it dies off with a Z, with turnover of these cells over time as the complement of cells decreases after a lack of stimulus. So the idea here is that this level of immune system activation is um, uh, is, the, is stimulated by um, 
you can see the inflow by the presence of infected cells. And once immune systems are available, they suppress the infected cells by killing them off. Okay. Um, simple model of the immune system. Uh, we've worked with some more involved models, much more involved models based on empirical studies. Um, conducted by uh, immunological uh, collaborators. Um, uh, Dear one, Ben Sahai was, was an important one early on uh, for things like flu. But the basic idea here is, is retained, that there's some dynamics in the immune system, typically with more stocks, and, and then some dynamics associated with the body, some viral load, and some... Um, dynamics associated with infection within the body. So this is kind of an outbreak within the body. And importantly, and this is of key importance for this model, this immunoepidemiological model, um, people can get infected. Their, their stock, their compartment, their state variable of virions can be built up by virions that, to which they're exposed from others to whom they, they are in contact over a network, okay? So that's the idea here. So we have people in a network and we have individuals who, who see the infection. They can lead to virions coming into others and uh, that leads to, uh, that leads to them getting some cells and of, of the other person infected. It, it builds up infected cells that activates their immune system response. And basically the number of infected cells rises. The viral dynamics is much faster initially than the immune system dynamics. So the viral dynamics rises, their immune system follows um, more slowly, but eventually reaches a level, it starts to kill off the infected cells at necessary levels. It brings down the immune response, uh, the, excuse me, the infected cells. That brings the infection under control and it slowly abates the number of infected cells. And then the, um, the immune system's activation will slowly decline as other, um, as the limited complement of the immune system cells conceptually gets devoted to other pathogens um, if it's not stimulated by this. But if they're exposed again in a short period of time, their immune activation will fight it off really well. Uh, will fight off another you know, exposure really well. They, they have immune memory that, that remembers this. So we've done a lot of work with immuno models like this to great insight. And they lead to very interesting dynamics. I'm going to run one of these scenarios because it's rather visually evocative. It, it's it's quite um, an interesting one to look at. So we're gonna run high fatal viral threshold. What that means is that in order for someone to die they uh, from the viral load, it has to reach a very high level of, of, um, of viral load. So only, only individuals with very weak immune systems would uh, would be um, killed off by the virus. Um, and that's what we can look at. We can look at different levels of immune, uh, immuno, um, uh, immuno strength, um, uh, immune, Im immune level competence. So you notice that, I probably should have emphasized this at first. So we have individuals in a network and I'm gonna slow this down so we can really see it play out here. So there's gonna be someone starting infected up here, somewhere in this region here. So we have people in a network, people have different levels of immune system strength, and that's gonna affect how quickly their body responds to the infection, thereby how high the viral load goes, how quickly they clear it, and by extension, they're likely to passing it on to neighbors, okay? Um, so I'll speed it up a little bit here, um, but there's going to be, someone introduced with the, there it is, okay. Okay, so what just happened? Um, I need to guide you. The, so the width of this cell, you notice that there are these little circles. The width of the circle has to do with the level of immune strength. 
the color, how red it is, has to do with their viral load level. So in other words, if it's if it's red, if it's very red, they have a high viral load. If it's mostly white, they have a low viral load. The, the radius reflects their immune system strength. So you're going to tell me, um, uh, this, this person here, this big, big, wide one, but it's white. What is that person's characteristic? Can anyone say? What's their characteristic? How much? What's their viral load level? Very low. This is white. What's their level of immune protection? Level of immune strength? Very high, right? That's why they're they're so wide. By contrast, how about this one here? This here one. How about that one? This one here. Compared. If you compare this one versus this person versus this one, whose viral load is higher? Yeah, this one. Whose who's, um, immune system strength is higher? The big one. The big one compared to this. So this is someone whose viral load, and in fact, you see what happens as a result. What happened to that person? Did, did their viral load go out, up after that or down? Went up because their immune system strength was low. It wasn't protecting them very well, so it rose. Here's someone with at like a peak of viral load. But they've gotten really wide, so what's that an indication of? What is responding? Their immune system, right? Their immune system is responding to it. Okay, here we go. So watch this. Now... What what's going on there? Why did those turn white? That means what? The viral load is being suppressed by the high level of immune system activation, right? And now the immune system is is protection is dying off. But this person has gotten infected. They're reaching a high level of viral load, but now it's being brought under control, so it's no longer expanding. It's no longer getting. Well, it's pretty darn red, and now it's fading, right? But meanwhile, they're infecting others nearby them through exposing them to virus. Think aerosols or something like this. And so it goes. So it goes on, right? Um, it, it travels around the network. And why would we build a model like this? Well, it's an idea vehicle for representing the effects of vaccination representing the effects of antivirals, representing the impacts of different levels of immune system strength. Think, think a very elderly person with a lower strength of immune system, someone is immunocompromised, maybe they're um, uh, a diabetic end-stage renal disease patient, maybe they're an individual taking immunosuppressant drugs for a, for a transplant, uh, and they're subject to real risks. And a, a model like this endogenizes the immune system response. That person will tend to build up their immune system strength less. It'll build it up slower. It'll go to a higher level of viral load. And it will tend to recover less quickly. And it will expose people, therefore, to more viruses. All of that is endogenized. All of that is captured automatically within this model. And you could vaccinate, you could simulate the effects of administering antivirals, you could simulate the effects of having less transmission of virus from one person to another, et cetera. But that's not all. We've been hiding one aspect of it that's critical that I mentioned before, okay? Um, and by the way, you can, you can, you can watch this. Um, is the fact that people can die if their viral load goes too high. It's a tragedy. This is a, a terrible thing, but it does have impact on the spread of infection. So let's go, so that was a high viral load threshold. So it needs to be really high levels of viral load to kill them. In fact, we didn't see anyone die. I didn't notice anyone um, removed from the population. Okay. Yes. 
Uh, that's right. Yeah. Uh, it it occurred just there. You arrived just in time, sir. Uh huh. Mind if I take a look? Yes, you're welcome to take a look. It's you know I'm, I'm going to need to be uh, continuing to leave this all day. Um, but I really appreciate you looking into it. Uh, this this is the main cabinet there, but that has some equipment too. Yeah. Thanks a bunch for coming over. Okay, so right now, for this scenario, the high viral load threshold, it has to reach a very high level of viral load for it to kill someone, for them to go across here and for them to be removed from the population. Let's go to a medium one. What would we expect to see if it was a medium viral load level? Anyone? Some people are going to die. That's right. And and that's going to you know, be terrible for them, but it's also going to break the train of transmission to some degree. You can see it here. So individuals who reached a very high level of viral load would normally expose people around them to massively more. They'd stay infected for longer. They'd, expo they'd reach higher levels of viral load because their immune system isn't catching up. And they might expose people to a lot of infection if they die that, you know, that's cut short, right, um, in a tragic way. But it, it has impact for on others. So we see here, you know, the the continued sort of reverberations of that outbreak, right, um, as they're exposing each other. And there's this kind of entrainment. But um, actually, I don't know that it's entrainment, but there's this continued exposure to one another. But it reaches some equilibrium. Uh, where they are have some circulating infection at a very low level of infection, and and their immune system stays uh, uh, stays uh, activated um, at a non-zero level. So, big picture, though, what what do we have here? We have people with, who have discrete dynamics among these state charts, as well as continuous dynamics described by the stock and flow. But characterized by the stock and flow theory. And indeed, this is a theory advanced, you know, in a book from book viral dynamics by um, Waters and May. Now their book didn't deal with immune epi, and it didn't deal with immuno epi, it just dealt with within host dynamics. What we did here and what we did in a number of other papers is link it up to infection spread across the population. Um, and we've done a fair bit of immune system modeling with that. We've also used a similar pattern again for weight, weight change um, uh, and uh, beta cell levels uh, and representation of glucose insulin dynamics and not necessarily at the finest grain level, but a kind of a prevailing level. Um, in other models with substance levels in body and and um, tolerance levels to narcotic to particular narcotics, et cetera. So, so this is another uh, ready readily applied pattern where you have more involved theory that's articulated at a at a uh, stock flow level or a level of continuous dynamics. You can apply this pattern. Um, often you can have theory-driven dynamics, um, can be declaratively specified, at least not notionally. Um, and you can see, you know, um, the impacts. Um, uh, yeah, okay, so I think we'll, um, we'll actually call up one more model like this. Um, I think rather than doing West Nile virus and spread geographically, I think we'll do this this one involving uh, space and, and location, since that's aligned with our next topic. So I'd like you to close this one. Any any questions about that? Any questions about that one? Yes. Okay. Do you remember how high? Um, yeah, viral load threshold. The, part of it may be because it's like a fixed seed right now, but there seems to be, um, the longer you run it, the larger the circles get. 
I'm curious about that. For the high. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, so we have papers on this um, dynamics to analyze these things. We so like not overall, but like that first run, you noticed that like the initial ones got were pretty small, and then um, and it, when it got to that kind of like the head of the horse, um, it like got very large. I was curious as to why that. Oh, was. you're saying. Not so much over time it yeah. gets larger. It's like spatially. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Um. By the way, these these controls are useful. This is run it as fast as you can. This is speed it up, slow it down. This is go back to single, single speed. Um. Um. Is this the head of the horse? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's... Hmm. Yeah, well, okay, one thing I will say. Uh, about uh, 4.30 to 5. I think they might have pulled the whole rag. So yeah. There's no backside to it. I'm yeah. scared that the back pull in. Yeah. I'm the computer. Right. I understand. Yeah. So I might have to get 80 texts to come after your session. Okay. Yeah. So, so um, I would request five or later. Okay. Okay. Thanks a bunch. Really appreciate your work with this, sir. Thanks greatly. Um. Yeah. So, I what I I, I suspect is the case. So, I, I have a I have a, a hypothesis for this. Okay. Um. The hypothesis is that um, it may just be due to the um. Uh, to the uh, placement of lower immunocompetence individuals here, people with less strong immune systems um, at those places. Um, and this could be investigated um, uh, if we if we had time. Um, you'll notice that people have different levels of, um, okay, no, why aren't I? Oh, I think it's, yeah, the, the parameters are here. You see these, um, there's two parameters associated with speed of, of um, cytotoxic T lymphocyte turnover. So basically how quickly does it wane, but also uh, governing how quickly their immune system responds to this. And um, right now um, there's uh, individuals viral load, if we go to main, um, is shaped by those quantities. If you go to population, you can see here their C level is drawn from, from this um, from this distribution. Um, so what I'm going to do um, is I think I'm going to do this or so. Um, we're going to do this quickly, but it will illustrate ways to investigate things. So I'm going to go to person. And I'm going to go over here and <clears throat> go to this little. So these are back in the day, any logic, you had to manually hitch them up with lines. Um, I had to teach the geometry of that. That was fun. Um, okay, so here's fill color, line width. I'm going to set line width to be determined by their um, integer value um, of C times 10, 10.0. Okay. Um, Bumble. Um, yeah. Um, so I'm going to set the, the width of it. And we're going to see if the people who are in the head of the horse, the horse without a name, um, if that, uh, if they have perhaps uh, different immune system strength. And um, we're going to see it successively. You notice 
you notice their width of their thing, like this is someone with lower immune strength here. Um, let's see what these ones are. Well, you know, they're not particularly strong. Um, yeah, um, so I'd have, oh, sorry, not particularly weak. Um, I was thinking they might be really weak and therefore they, um, it, it reaches a much higher level uh, before it brings it under control. Doesn't seem to be obviously the case. Um, I'd have to take a look at it. It could be something about network structure. I don't think so. If anything, I would think someone with lots of neighbors might seed them with more infection. But after that, it's endogenously driven. Um, yeah, so I'd have to investigate more. But um, okay, um, good question. Any any uh, further uh, further question? By the way, we could do a different randomization with the same horse shape if you want. But but let let's not go there. Okay, any questions with this one? Okay, let's 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 do the the next in this kind of of this class of models, which is this one here. With pathogen reservoir. Um, okay, um, here we go. Hybrid models, and it's um, environmental contamination hybrid. Okay, yeah, you know, environmental contamination hybrid. Here we go. Um, and I'd like you to download it. Mm -hmm. Right. And now let's. Open it up. Okay, so here we have a model like that we examined on the first day. We have people, workplaces, homes. People circulate between home and workplace. Each person has work time and off time. No community places. Um, here, they're either in a susceptible state, a shedding state, or recovered. And the idea is this might be something like a fecal oral infection, maybe like norovirus, for example. Um, and uh, they shed it um, into their environment. Uh, and if you look at their workplace, there's a reservoir, pathogen reservoir. Yeah. It's built up by shedding, an inflow from shedding, people who shed there, shed virus, um, and it, it uh, decays over time due to some sort of die-off of the population uh, of, of pathogen. Okay, um, you notice home is the same basic thing. So it's a per capita shedding rate, when people are there, they shed, it builds up a reservoir, and then it deactivates over time. Now, each of those, the dynamics of each of those is gonna be shown here by a coloring. So, so there's this little square next to each of them, um, each of these things that appears that basically the, the redder, it is, or the higher the pathogen reservoir at that location, that stock, the redder it will appear. Okay. So we got to run this. Let's, let's. And here we have people ensconced in homes, and we have workplaces to which they will report um, during the workday. And here we go. Um, they, they go to workplaces. Well, that's kind of kind of interesting um, that it made the, I would have expected the, the workplace to become really big, but you'll notice they're shedding in different places. Some of the homes now have very little pathogen Others of high pathogen. And when the people are at the homes, they're picking up pathogen. They're getting infected by pathogen through environmental infection. 
the first person is infected exogenously, sort of at the start, but then they pick it up from their environment based on their current exposure level. So Matthew seems unimpressed by that, but um, um, I think you, Matthews, you, you wanted like to be able to navigate to things based on the, on the code navigation. I think it was you who said that, but you know, you can click on this and it will bring you there, right? Um, okay, so there's this, um, uh, there's a current exposure level each person has, if they're in the workplace, then they use the workplace pathogen where they're currently in place. If they're at home, they use the home pathogen reservoir to figure out their exposure level. So each person has a, uh, a hazard rate determined by the surrounding pathogen reservoir, right? If they're at work, it's the workplace one with which they're associated. If they're at home, it's the home one. And um, and basically, uh, they move between them. Okay, um, so they have a workplace and a home assigned to them. Great. Um, so, so again, what happens over time? Wait, could you figure out why the uh, home becomes so big here, like when they're at work? And okay, so this is this is the starting one, but watch this. Okay, there's probably someone in, in this is going to be starting to to spread infection. Um, oh, okay. like why is this so big? They're obviously at the workplace, but but the home becomes huge. Okay, this home is becoming big, so now they're going to bring it to their workplace. Look at that, this workplace is becoming thick. And what's going to happen because of the workplace? What's going to What's going to happen as a result of that workplace getting contaminated? What's going to happen as soon as people go home? It's going to infect people, and then they're going to bring it home, right? And some of those people at the various homes with which they share the home, they're going to go to their uh, different workplace the next day, and they'll bring it there, and it spreads around in the most unseemly and, and sordid way. Yes, wait. Yes. Based on the people there. But the number of people within an arbitrary radius. Of the yes. Okay. So it just happens the home and the in the workplace are co-located. Yes. And so it makes the home extra big too. Okay. Okay. Well, we could put in logic to only enlarge that to, to only basically keep it at normal size unless they're except if they're present at that time of the day. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so these are shedding profiles. We have people infected by the environment based on the level of pathogen in the environment who then bring it to new environments and shed there and the cycle continues, okay? And, you know, you could have remediation measures. You could have cleaning at workplaces. You could seek to test uh, individuals and have them stay home. You could, you could have disinfection, um, um, mediated disinfection. You could reduce shedding or what have you. But, you know, we, we don't have time to, to go try a lot of things. But I think you understand now we've woven these two together in a new way. Now, um, uh, as I alluded to earlier, um, these strategies are versatile, really useful, but we have, we, there's a big, there's a big consideration. So, um, the, the way any logic is set up, um, particularly if you, um, if you're not careful and you don't put into place some basic mechanisms, the, um, putting in place a stock flow model um, at the same time as you have agents circulating will lead to a lot of overhead. 
um, because the stock flow model naively will be um, will be affected by agents updating across the entire model. Now, there's a way in any logic to tell it um, to use a um, uh, use a solver that does not pay attention to the events elsewhere in the model. And it's called the um, uh, event-aware solver. And you can set it to not use the event-aware solver. So basically, it's not going to worry in solving the stock flow model about what events are going off for agents elsewhere. And that's useful, but it's still very expensive. It's still very expensive. Uh, it's less expensive, but still very expensive. And when we have sought to uh, employ uh, a model like this at scale, um, we generally keep the basic design of the stock flow model, but we, um, we employ it in a way that is uses some custom bit of code to perform the same work as the stock flow model would perform at a much higher rate of, of performance. Um, and that's not hard to do. It's quite straightforward. Um, but it is something which is um, which requires some some guidance uh, if you've done it the first time. Um, generally, we use uh, I will generally seek to use the stock flow model, system dynamics, you know, built in stock flow model to get the model right, to get it as I want it, experiment with it, iterate. But then when we use need to scale it up, we need large, you know, modest sized or larger populations. We'll put in place this code, which performs the same work, but much more cheaply. And Wade will be someone to talk to about that, but we've used it on many projects and, and I can you know, also talk about it. Generally speaking, you can speed it up vastly if you are willing to write some code instead of always just keeping it as a system dynamics model. So it's a great pattern. It's a very effective pattern. Um, it, it sees uh, quite a bit of use in our group but you want to use it advisedly and savvily. Um, and there's good ways to do that and get, you know, acceptable performance for decent sized populations uh, uh, by, by being intelligent about how to go about it. Yeah, by being careful on how to go about it. Okay. Stock flow together with agents and comes kind of stock flow within agents. Here, the stock flow is within the workplace agent and within the home agent. And as Wade will generally tell you, I mean, this is a very nice teaching model. It's very clear and kind of clear, but you could capture this basic dynamics very straightforwardly without the need for truly putting in place the stock flow model. You, 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 get, it's, you do something that's morally the same but vastly less expensive and it's still quite elegant. But for this, it's, you know, the conceptual model is the same. It's just, you implement it in a savvy way. Yeah. Questions about this, those sort of models? Very powerful, you know, um, pattern that we see again and again. Okay, let's, let's, Go to another one, if we may. Oh, question. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I, I stopped screen share. Yeah, um, because I'm I'm going in and uh, doing some stuff with the slides right now. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Yes. Um, do we want to do this one? Um, Right. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. This one is is worth is worth seeing. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, moving again through various patterns here. Um,
Another quite common need. Um, one that's, I'd say, undersubscribed in our work, but um, very obviously applicable for areas we've considered modeling and will will likely model. Areas involving things like the, oh, wait, another blank, commercial determinants of health uh, or um, some aspects of service delivery and populations, et cetera, um, involves agents that drive aggregate system dynamics models. So here you have a population of people or of deer or of mosquitoes or what have you. And and you don't wish to characterize them at an individual level. But instead, you have a, so maybe your level of focal interest is, is just not at a, um, and not requiring resolution at, at an individual level. You don't require tracking individuals over time. You don't require tracking their history. You don't have the tremendous need for heterogeneity in your mosquito population or your population of deer. Maybe it's just age categories and sex or something like that. Um, and a, a stock flow model meets your needs. But what you want potentially is representation of other agents. Maybe they're companies. Maybe they're community organizations. Um, maybe they are uh, individual um, you know, tobacco companies or food companies or or companies involved in um, in in marketing uh, marketing products uh, in the e-cigarette space, and they try to sell product, and they end up um, influencing the behavior of people in the population. And maybe your focus is in interventions and um, strategies that will um, prevent collusion or, or um, that will limit their ability to spread this information um, or, or um, lead to, you know, uh, adverse social media environments for teens or what have you. But you're not interested in simulating all the teens, perhaps, in this model. You're interested in simulating the, the drivers for it, the commercial drivers, and influencing those and intervening on those. So um, we have uh, potential partners, who, for example, who are very interested in service delivery of community-based organizations and cross-sectoral units for kids with developmental challenges, for example, or the earliest years of education where kids from with lower incomes need extra assistance and these community-based organizations can, can step in. So here... Your focus is on these agents, but it, you're interested in how it impacts these higher level outcomes, but that's not where your, your details are in your model. Your details are, are down at the community-based level. Maybe these are, um, yeah, maybe these are food banks and organizations involved in uh, farms and, and um, uh, uh, you know, alternative vendors for foods that that can provide food for, um, for poor individuals through food banks. And, um, uh, and, and this is a, a networking ecosystem of food exchanges. We've been involved in that sort of space uh, together with my former student and colleague, Kurt Kruger, um, with the um, Hollywood, um, uh, the Hollywood uh, food, Food Collective, I, I'm, I'm misremembering the name, but also the Saskatoon Food Bank. So, so you have this ecosystem of, of organizations and you're interested in how that serves the population without tracing population numbers. Um, so here you can capture the overall population at an aggregate level without making it individuals, without turning them all into agents. Just because you use agents for these doesn't mean you have to use agents for these. And then you can have these ones influence those, right? Maybe these are you know, companies related to vaccination too, uh, pharmaceutical companies, what have you. 
So let's open this basic health economics model. Um, and I want to show you some patterns through that that we're going to, to use. Okay. Um, so here we're going to go. Sorry. Um, we want to download that. Okay. Here we go. Um, okay. Basic health economics. And we're going to download. Great. Okay, let's close the other model we had opened, the contamination one.